Okay. Uh, Thanks for coming to talk and also welcome to Bristol. Uh, I live here, I live about 10 minutes away. So uh, I didn't have to pay for a plane ticket. I didn't have to pay for a hotel room. So the least I can do is buy everyone a drink. If you see me at the, any of the events, one per person. <laughs> in return, perhaps I could ask you to put your hands up if you've ever had to participate in the pricing of an audio plugin or a bit of music software. Yep, me too. Uh, this time, put your hands up if you had any idea what you were doing? <laughs> okay, yeah, I put my hand up because at least I thought back then that I did. Um, I had spent five years working as a journalist at a magazine that basically was all about plugins. And so whenever anyone launches a plugin, I saw it, I reported about it to the public and watched the review cycle, lifetime cycle of the plugin, and pricing was always part of that. Um, since then, for the last seven years or so, I've, I've been helping plugin developers, large and small, with their marketing. Um, and I've launched a lot of products. Uh, my main objective is to work with both the biggest and the smallest and companies that don't even exist yet. So if you've got a great idea, come and tell me about it, uh, because for some people I can work for free. Um, so the first time I did this, priced an audio plugin. I was working with a client on a new plugin, his first plugin. He thought the price should be $49, and I was shooting for the price to be $29. We went back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, he won, because it was his plugin, $29. And it went on sale. We launched it, it did very well. We were very happy with it. A couple of days later, we were talking through the sales, going through the orders in accordance with the privacy policy, and 29, 29, 29, 29, 29, 29, 29, 29. And of course, it's that point where he said, what would have happened if we'd put it on for 49? <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know what would have happened if we put it on for 49, because I can never know. I can never go back in time and put it on at a different price. And there are some things you can do, of course, later on. In preparation for this talk, I asked some of my biggest clients, companies that you all know and that you all have plugins by, how they price their plugins. And overwhelmingly, the answers came back that almost all cases, they use their intuition and analysis of their competition. There was one who said they have a bit of a formula. Obviously, they wouldn't tell me what the formula was but almost everyone basically has a discussion. You could say they put their finger up to the wind and they came up with a price. That's a TLDR for this talk. If you can take one thing away, don't worry. Even the big companies are not guessing. They're using their experience. They're using all the intuition they've built up by knowing the market so well and they're analyzing their competitors. But it'd be a pretty bad talk if I was going to stop after three and a half minutes and leave you at that. So I do have a lot more actionable things for you uh, to actually bring to bear if you're ever pricing a plugin. So let's go through some common principles for driving prices. You'll probably know them. Supply and demand is the obvious one. If you, have, if you set a certain price at which supply and demand meet, that's a good price. It's an equilibrium price. Um, Supply and demand, I've always had a problem with in our industry because we sell digital goods. And for digital goods, supply is basically infinite. Under a supply and demand model, that means that price should tend towards zero. Uh, you could argue with freeware or with certain companies, prices are going down. It is possible to do everything with free plugins, as you probably know. But people still buy them and we still sell them. So, Supply and demand's never quite sat right, that's the only thing for me. Production cost, how about that? You take the price it costs you or the time it costs you to make the thing, you work out how many you think you're going to sell, divide one by the other, and you get the price you think you should charge. Never do that, it's a bad idea. This talk isn't really for hardware manufacturers, um, but you could use that to set your lower bound if you are doing hardware. Um, 
if you've got something such as iLock native access and such, then you've got a minimum that you must pay for every license. So you've got a lower bound there, but generally don't use production cost. How about competitor pricing? That's an obvious one. I think we can all agree on that. Your buyer is going to be looking at the same things too. You plot all the plugins in your market, x-axis is price and y-axis can be multiple things actually this is the multi-band compressor market or at least five things from it um, most expensive to the cheapest and i think i've put something like how many features each has on the y-axis something like that uh, you could also do it by how professional some uh, if is it tilted towards professionals or amateurs on the y-axis or anything um, with a number of things you can do, but by lining that up with the price, you can find your gap in the market in a visual sense. That's an okay thing to do, and it's very worth it. Um, finally, a quick note. What's the difference between a bottle of water and a diamond? Um, one is very, 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 very cheap. One is very, very, very expensive. <laughs> the water is very, very useful. We need it. We all use it all the time. It's used in almost every industrial manufacturing process in the world, but it's the cheap one. Diamonds, uh, I'm sure they, they have their uses in things, but generally a lot fewer uses than does water. And yet the diamond is the expensive one and the water is the cheap one. Why? Because of their relative rarity. That's basically the only thing that's setting those prices. Comes back to supply and demand a bit there. There is one thing underlying all these things. I think these are abstractions of what's really going on. And because we work in the digital world, we have access to what's really underneath. And that's the perceived value of any given buyer. If you speak to a marketing person for long enough, or as long as you can stand, they will eventually start talking about perception. How it's the perception of the buyer that really moves things. If you've ever been to an auction or done some eBaying, you'll probably know there is a price above which you are not willing to pay for something. You have a sort of maximum price. That can change day to day, it can change product to product. But I want you to start thinking about your prospective market as a load of people walking around with a number above their head. And that number is the price they are willing to pay for a thing. Obviously, a different product will have a different number. Different time of day will probably have a different number, but in general, that's how I want you to start thinking about it. Price, someone is willing to pay. Okay? Do a little, I'm just gonna skip that. Let's do a little exercise. That's your market. There are two people in the world willing to buy your thing. One is willing to pay 30, the other is willing to pay 70. If you put your price on at 70, how much money will you get? you'll get 70. If instead of that, you put your price on at, say, 50, how much money will you get? 50. Because the 70 person is definitely willing to pay 50 as well, but the 30 person, no. If you set your price instead to 30, how much will you get? 60. Good. Okay, that worked. Yeah. Okay. So note in that example, obviously incredibly simple, uh, the higher price got you the most money. This time, set it to 70, how much do you get? 70, set it to 50, how much do you get? 50, set it to 30, you get 90. And in this case, the lower price got you the most money. Top one, sorry. Yeah, this, in this case, the lower price got you the most money. Uh, okay, let's elaborate that even more. Set to 70, you get 70, set to 50, you get 100, and set to 30, you get 150. Now, there is another way to do it, which you all know. Most of you do it. And it's to put the plugin on sale. Effectively, a sale gives you two price points. It gives you the more expensive price and later the lower price. So what if you put the plugin on at 70 MSRP, person at 70 buys it, then after a little while you've got a sale, it's November, uh, goes down by $20, the person who's willing to pay 50 buys it, 
and then maybe there's a coupon you put around the internet, giving it to some influencers, something like that. The people willing to pay 30 now come in. What you've done there is you've made, what, 210. The developer, by running a sale, has maximized their revenue. And that's why we really have sales. It's not just short-termist, oh, let's get some money in now because at the expense of the long term. It's because everyone has a different price they are willing to pay. And this brings that out. <laughs> that's not to say that it's ethical. It's not to say that it's good to have constant sales. I think nobody wants to be in this situation that we're in. I'm going to put in to do a talk next year about how we might be able to stop or reduce the number of sales that happen and discounts that happen in our industry. It might be swimming in against the tide, but if anyone's interested in that, get in touch with me within the next year and we'll see if we can make something happen. Um, but that's why. And there's a, that's a bit of a better reason to do sales. Okay, let me elaborate this even more. This is not real data. It's just a bunch of squares that I drew. But here's how I want you to start thinking about pricing. On the left, you've got lots of people willing to pay a small price for your thing. On the right, you've got a few people willing to pay a high price for your thing. What happens when you set a price? Let's say we set a low price. You set that price, everyone below that price drops out because they're not willing to pay that. Everyone who was willing to pay that pays that price, even though they would have paid more. Redbox gives you the total revenue. Okay, what about if we set a higher price? Everyone to the left drops out. Everyone else to the right pays the price that you set, even if they would have paid more. And with a sale, you get a mix of both. In this case, again, this is real data stuff I drew. The red box on the lower price gets more, the red box on the higher price gets more. That proves nothing, of course, but that's how I think we should all be thinking about it. Um, you don't get to know this. I don't think you'll ever get to know this. Maybe some of the biggest companies will have enough data to approximate this, but again, on any given day, at any given time, it's going to be different and the best we can do. I would, I would suggest that it's generally a smooth roll off with some drops and those sudden drops are probably at your competitor's price and at milestones like $50, $100 and there's one per currency, so 50 pounds, 100 pounds, stuff like that. <laughs> at the end, it's so complicated that all we can really do is analyze our competition and use our intuition. But again, I'm not just going to leave you with that either because I promised 12 things, 12 ways that you can set a price. I'm going to give you something that was originally meant to be an equation, but then I thought, who am I kidding? I can't put an equation in front of these people's eyes. So here's something like an equation. Let's talk through this. Your price is proportional to your competitor's price. Obviously, any potential buyer is going to be comparing you to your competitor's but what about your competitor's exposure? Your competitor may have something cheaper than yours and better than yours, but it doesn't matter if no one can see it. If no one knows they exist, they'll choose you. Uh, the uniqueness of your plugin. We were talking about rarity before. If you're selling just another compressor, just another pull tech, whatever it is, it's harder, you'll have to choose generally a lower price because there's a lot of competition. If yours is the best, then yes, you can probably charge higher. That's fine. On the other hand, if you've got something new, something that no one really has experienced before, let's say you've developed a, a transient pineapple and no one knows what it is. You are the only one who sells it and so you can probably charge more for it because you're rare. The problem you then have is being able to explain to people what it is in about five seconds while you have their attention. That's a different matter. Um, are you selling to professionals or hobbyists? Because the professionals, of course, will charge more 
things are more worth it to them. They're willing to pay more because they've got money on the line. So they're willing to spend if it makes their work quicker or easier. Hobbyists, less so. Um, what about your audience size? Audience size is the audience that you can reach directly. So it could be the people you've got on your mailing list, the people you've got on your social media. When you go to them and they see something from you, they're not necessarily comparing you to your competitors. They're taking you alone and they're comparing you only if they choose to. So your audience size will affect the price you can charge. Uh, is it an instrument? Is it an effect? Instruments, of course, you've, you've probably seen, just go on KVR, you'll see that the instruments are all way more expensive and people are willing, again, there's that word, willing to pay more for them. Effects less so, there are more of them as well. Obviously, it's harder to make an instrument, but that's your problem. Um, aesthetic appeal. Does your plugin look good? Anyone who's been in this business for like one or two years has worked out. It needs to look good as well. Otherwise, people won't trust it. Same goes for your website and your branding. Does it look good? Does it inspire trust? Is someone willing to give you $50, $100, $150? You can make your website a bit too good looking as well, I think. You could appear too slick, especially if you're selling something small. But um, here's a couple of factors. Multiply your price by 1.4 because you don't understand your own worth. Just like the person in my example at the start, you probably can sell it for more than you think and you're probably being too humble. I've seen it happen a lot. Um, upgrade pricing, I was going to gloss over this, but I'm ahead of time, so um, you'll have seen some stuff happening recently with, for example, Studio One, uh, Arturia V Collection, they've all had upgrade prices that a lot of people have complained about on the forums, you know. Um, I reckon that developers have worked out, or the big companies have worked out, people are more willing to pay upgrade prices than they might think. Um, so I think they're going to be rising. If you could choose any subset of people from the 8 billion in the universe who are going to buy version three of your thing, how about the people who bought version one, version two of your thing? That's probably why upgrade prices seem to be crawling higher. A couple of little ones, the most significant digit. Uh, don't put your thing on at 71, put it on at 79. I've seen it work properly. Um, get under milestones. Don't charge 50, charge 49. Don't charge 100, charge 99. And you've got to think about your different currencies there as well. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks for coming. And I'll uh, see you around.